morning, um, I want to spend hopefully a few minutes um, with you on a subject that I have been looking at over the years. And I think that right now for the church, as it is going through its final crisis, it is very, very important uh, that we equip ourselves daily to meet Jesus. Um, this is what, 2023? And I remember many, many years ago as a child when they used to have this cartoon on TV called The Jetsons. And what it was was that it depicted what was going to happen in the year 2000. And I didn't think we was ever going to re reach the year 2000. But here we are now 23 years after that living in the time of the end if you understand what that is essentially we are between the sixth and seventh seal of the book of revelation in essence jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary in the most holy place doing his final work and when all is said and done he will come home to bring back those whom have served him and lived for him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your holy Sabbath. We're thankful for being here. And as we take a look at this subject matter, we ask you, dear God, that you would be with us and guide us and speak through me in Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. You can just take that off. I'm not ready for it yet. We read this morning, and we're going to read it again, and there are going to be some words within the text that we're going to focus on as a springboard into this topic. Paul says, but all things that are reproved, as we read, and you should have your Bibles, I don't think this is on the screen, are made manifest. Ephesians 5, 13 and 14, I'll give you a chance to find it. Um, I'm not sure what's happening in the back on the screen. Rereading it over, but all things that are approved, coming from the King James Version, are made manifest by the light for who, well, so whatsoever doth make manifest is light. In verse 14, where I'm going to be focusing on, wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. If I had to look at these, this text, and I had to extract some words from it, uh, these are the words within the verses that I would be picking out. Number one, I would pick out the word reproved. Number two, I would pick out the word manifest. Number three, I would pick out the word uh, awake. And number four, I would pick out the word dead. So let's just take a look for a few moments as a springboard into this topic. So the, Paul says here, all of things that are reproved. And the word reproved comes from the Greek word Elegeko. It simply means to refute, to convict, to correct, or to reprove a bad decision. So we have the first lesson. And number two, the word manifest. Manifest simply means to make clear, expose, or evident to the understanding. So that which is manifested is, means that which has been made clear. And finally, we have the word dead. And when we talk about dead in the context of the scripture, we're talking about spiritual death. So we have reproved, which is to refute or to convict or to correct. We have manifest, which means to make clear or expose. And we have dead, which in a sense means spiritually dead. And then finally, we have 
the word awake. So let's talk for a moment about this word awake. The word awake comes from the Greek word ekneko, which means to wake up from a deep sleep or from a stupor. It means also, continuing this, it means to be figuratively aroused out of a stupor of spiritual delusion or spiritual sleep and coming to one's senses. So when someone is awoke, they are brought out of a stupor. Recently, I was in a hospital on the 4th of July, and uh, my left knee had gone out. And it had gone out to the point where the pain was so bad that I couldn't bend it. And when I got into the, the, the emergency room, the doctors was mentioning certain drugs to give me. And I don't know what any of these drugs are because really I don't take pain uh, uh, killers. But there's one drug that was called Oxy, what is that Cheryl, Oxy? Oxy what? Oxypotent. Now I didn't know what that thing was, but I know one thing after I took it, the knee was able to bend even though it was in pain. I know another thing after I took it that what it actually did was it made me very, very drowsy. And what I later found out concerning this particular drug was this. And they gave me 10 capsules afterwards that this drug is one of the drugs that's normally used by kids as something that's chemical dependent. And I didn't know that. So that they was giving me something and on the way home I started going in and out, in and out, in and out. And when I got home, I finally realized when, I, when Cheryl was talking to me that this drug, what it does is just makes you really drowsy. Spiritual lethargy or spiritual sleep is similar to this. You have absolutely, you are not conscientious as to the fact as to what is spiritually going on. And when you are actually awoken, you snap out of that intoxication. And you become, into reality, you're brought back into a keen awareness. An awakening in the spiritual sense happens when the light of truth is turned on. We are told something in the book of Genesis that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we go further down and we find out what was the first thing that God created? Light. And as light, and I think that is called photosynthesis, what ended up happening now, light brought about life. And we are told something interesting about uh, the awakening and when it comes to light and life. In John chapter 1 and verses 1 and 4, the Bible tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in verse 4, the Bible tells us further that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So the awakening influence and light both uh, go together. We find something further on this is that the awakenings are also a call to arms to get up, to get busy in performing a specific work or task before a specific time period runs out. Romans chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, Paul says this, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let's kind of dissect this text. I like getting into the word from the pulpit as world as home the same way. Knowing the time slash the high time. The time period alluded in this text is a specific time period. It's a definite time period that is measured or fixed or critical. Not only that, high time simply means that the time is already at hand. So what the apostle is telling us, listen, folks, it's, it's time for you to wake up because the time is here and the time is now. Casting off the works of darkness 
and putting on the armor of light is at two ends. Casting off in the Greek means to throw aside, to put off from oneself. Um, this word, if you go back and look in your scriptures, is used a number of times in the New Testament to describe putting away of evil habits. So what Paul is telling us that we need to cast off our evil habits. And then the next thing Paul says within the same text, he tells us that we are to put on. Now it's very interesting for the Bible scholars to understand this in the Greek, that the word enduo is the Greek word for putting on. And one of the interesting things with the definition of the word is that it means in the sense of sinking into a garment. as you go and you look behind the words, it is not just putting on any type of outfit. It is settling and sealing into the, into the righteousness of Christ. Settling, sealing, <laughs> adhesing to the foundation which is Christ Jesus. Going forward. And I lost some of my pages here. Wow. Throughout scripture, whether it be of the Old or New Testament, whether it be old-time Israel or modern Israel, there always has been an awakening call, a call that is given to arouse God's people to arms. And the message that Paul gives within this text alludes us to shaking off of lukewarmness and putting on the character of Christ. That message is even so more relevant today. In a statement, first slide please, that I found years ago in the Review and Herald, March 22nd, 1887, Ellen White makes reference to the church's greatest need of today. And I wanna make sure this slide gets on the screen that you see the success of slides. She says, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To ask or to seek, this should be our first work. She further says in the same periodical article, she says, we have far more to fear from within than without. The hindrance to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. In other words, the only thing that can stop God's church from moving forward is God's people. Okay? All right? A revival of true godliness is needed. And if you look at what's happening in mainstream Adventism today, can you concur and agree that this is what is needed? She says further, next slide, please, that I found another article on this in Review and Herald, February 25th, 1902. And uh, what I would encourage you all is to go out and uh, I think sometimes in some of these, um, these, these apps, they have some of these things. This information came from actual uh, uh, printings that I actually uh, uh, got years ago. So she says the further, a re revival and reformation must take place under the ministration of the Holy Spirit. Follow me further on this. Revival and reformation are two different things. Listen to her on this further. Revival, coming back to life, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, signifies a renewal of spiritual life, a quickening of the powers of mind and heart, a resurrection from spiritual death. That's a revival. You with me? A reformation, however, signifies a reorganization, a change in ideas and, the and theories, habits and practices. Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the spirit. Revival and reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must blend. I love it. 
Again, Review and Herald, February 25th, 1902. Now here's where the computer part of me comes in logically on this. Follow me. So what is said here is that a revival is renewal of spiritual life. It brings life to, to the individual. It quickens of powers and of mind and of heart. And number three, it is a resurrection from spiritual death. A reformation, on the other hand, goes even further. It is reorganization. It is a change in ideas and theories, habits and practices. Ideas and theories start in the mind. And it represents a change in thinking, a change in your behavior or conduct. And it is the reestablishing of the biblical landmarks. That's a reformation. The reason why I became a Seventh-day Adventist is simply this, and this is what I tell people what Seventh-day Adventism is all about. The essence of what we believe is to restore in us the image of God like Adam before the fall. We're talking about revival and reformation here. Your conduct will not change unless your thinking changes. Because things that are acted out of your actions, they start in the mind. Now, follow me further on this as I kind of looked at this thing to try to get an understanding. Because within our church, Chiz, back all the way during her time to now, and she mentions this in the great controversy, there have been false revivals. And here's, what you, and here's how we conclude this. Revival without reformation, number one is not true revival. Second, reformation without revival is not true reformation. Let me say that again. Revival without reformation is not true revival. I don't know what that is. Reformation without revival is not true reformation. Revival without reformation is emotionalism. Point blank. This touchy-feely, this... Uh, uh, a style of worship that we get ourselves into, that we hype everything up, and then at the end of the day, we go off and we are the same way, or even worse. You know, an upper that you take when you do your college exams, whoever used to do that. And then after the final's over, you, you, you feel wasted and everything else. Sorry. Um, a a re reformation without revival is legalism, okay? So you can try to change your life without a revival, it is legalism. You can keep a day of the week, you can eat the right foods, you can dress the right way, and you can carry a Bible looking good. But at the end of the day, you still can be lost. In order to experience a reformation, there must be be a revival. And we're talking about true revivals, church. We're talking about revivals that are of what Mrs. White mentioned as primitive godliness. You see, there's going to come a time in Earth's history real soon in which what's going to happen is that you're not going to be able to, op you and I are not going to be able to worship openly anymore. As a matter of fact, in the book Craig Controversy, um, she, she mentioned something very interesting, and I mentioned to this church several times how many times I've read that book. But she says that none but those who stand for the word of God will be able to go through the last great conflicts. And that is true. Because if you are not founded, if your, 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 your methods, if your ideologies, if anything that you believe in is not based on the rock Christ Jesus, you're going to have a problem. And little by little, what we are seeing here, right here in America, from decisions being made in the Supreme Court all the way further, we're seeing slowly but slowly our rights being taken away. Recently, um, in, in, the, in the month of July, something happened in the financial world, which I don't think many of us are paying attention to. 
And it's the beginning of the implementation of digital currency. And what normally ends up happening when people start to implement something uh, or computerize it, and I worked in, I work in the financial industry for now 27 years, out of my uh, 39 years in the industry, is this. Computerizing something gives a, a person the power to control. Power to determine as to whether or not you buy or you sell. So it behooves us now to get ourselves ready for that which is to come. A revival without reform, as I said before, leading to a change in behavior is hypocrisy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45, the Apostle Paul says this, and so it is written, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45, I know for the people in the back it's a little hard to switch. I didn't give them the uh, slides. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45, the Bible says this. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Adam became a living soul, but Jesus Christ is a life giver. The same Jesus who has the power to raise the physical dead, has the power to revive the spiritually dead. And one can only be brought back to life spiritually when the revival and the reformation process is ministered under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Desire of Ages, next slide please, page 307, I think it is there. Desire of Ages, page 307 says this, the religion of the Bible is not to be confined between the covers of a book, nor within walls of a church. It is not to be brought out occasionally for our own benefit, and then to be carefully laid aside again. It is to sanctify the daily life, to manifest itself in every business transaction and all our social relationships. True character is not shaped from without and put on. Where does it come from? It comes from within. Revival starts from within. What does that song says? It only takes a spark to get a fire going and soon all those around will warm up in its glowing that's how it is with God's love. Once you experience it. Yes. Hmm. Amen. So true character is not shaped from without and put on. It radiates from within. Earlier, it was stated that a revival is the quickening of the powers of the mind and of the body. In the book of Proverbs, you can write these texts down if you can't find them. Chapter 23 and verse 7. Solomon tells us this. For as a man, Proverbs 23 and verse 7. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is what? So is he. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. The Bible tells us further, keep thy heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. So the question is asked, how can Satan gain entrance to the soul? How can he overtake us? We find something again in the book Adventist Home, page 401. Um, this is a book my wife and I read right before we got married. And it says this. Next slide, please. Adventist Home, page 401. It says the following. All should guard the senses, lest Satan gain the victory over them. For these are the avenues of the soul. Page 401, a little further down. You will have to become a faithful sentinel over, and these are the avenues, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, 
I always forget one. And the touch, thank you. All of your senses, if you would control your mind and prevent vain and corrupt thoughts from staining your soul. So to guard the avenues of the soul are the five senses. And to guard against the avenues of the soul is what we are counseled to do. Going forward. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, next slide, please, page 511, an equation that she uses. Your imagination was not given you to be allowed to run riot and have its own way without the, any effort or rest, at restraint or discipline. And then she tells us this, if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And what makes up the moral character? The thoughts and the feelings combined. So this living machinery, that Ellen White calls it, is a combination, the character is a combination of the thoughts and the feelings. Look what is going on with our youth today. Um, we have a, a record level in 2023 of gun violence in the areas of Chicago, in the areas of Los Angeles, further south. Um, recently, sometime last year during the pandemic, um, we had inter, uh, issues of of, of gangs of young people running into stores and pulling in for, and pulling things out. Why is this so? Because the avenues of the soul are not being guarded. Wrong music. Here I go. Even the food that you eat can numb the senses and cause you to make immoral decisions. Yep. So if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings are wrong, and the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. Years ago, this church ran a program called Binding of the Wounds. It's an emotional program that is there for any counselors. I think we might have, we have some teachers inside this church and counselors, in which the program basically was written by Ron and, uh, Ron and Nancy Rocky, two PhDs from Faith for the Day, Adventists. And within that program, it talks about emotional healing. But one of the things that it talks about is that in order to be emotionally healed, in order to be emotionally healed from your prayer life being blocked, um, your, your physical life uh, 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 not being stunted, stinted, you have to go back to the root of the matter. And what, she count, what they counsel as you do a history of yourself a history of your family, all the way back to the, to the beginning to see where the bad habits and the discouragements come from. The same thing I would like to subject to you when it comes to the situation with man. And we need to look at two areas in which Jesus is the center of. We need to look at the Garden of Eden, the place of our creation, and we need to look at Calvary, the place of our redemption. We find something that we know of in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 27, a very, very amazing text if you really go back and look at it, especially um, um, from the Greek and Hebrew, scho uh, Greek scholar, uh, Hebrew scholars, I'm sorry, that we go and look at it. And it says, putting back on my frames here, my eyes, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Not just, the, 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 the text does not stop there. It says, male and female created he them. So when man and woman were made, they were created perfect in the sight of God. Um, man was spiritually alive. The man and the woman's behavior was a reflection of God's character. If I had to summarize the first three chapters of Genesis, I would summarize them this way. Before sin entered into the world, Everything was other-centered. Are you following me? Everything was unselfish. Everything was in harmony with, with, with his creator. But after sin came into the world, after the original family, the original home was broken up, everything became self-centered. Self took the throne, and the core of man's being changed from serving others to serving self. When sin entered into the world, man spiritually died. 
They were unable to live in harmony with God's law, and they were unable, moreover, to live in harmony with one another. So if we had to talk about a relationship symbol in the, in the form of a cross, man's relationship was severed this way, and it was severed this way. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and death passed unto all men, for that all men have sinned. But I'm not going to finish the text there as I open my Bible to the book of Romans chapter 5, because I don't want to give the, the devil any type of glory. The Bible tells us further this, in verse 17, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Yes. So all the, be it that, that, that death came into the world through one man, Calvary undid that all. For it was at Calvary that everything was made right. Yeah. Earlier in the, in, the, in, in the Sabbath school lesson today, we were, talk, we were talking about the fact that what was the real meaning of Calvary? Could you imagine if there was no plan of salvation? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that at all? Paul makes emphasis on this, and I can't remember in what text of what he says, that if there was no resurrection in this life, men would be most miserable. Yeah. And that is the absolute truth. Men would be most miserable. So the Bible calls the works of a man who is spiritually dead the Bible terms this as dead works. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, in reference to this, Paul makes this reference when he says the following, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through e the eternal spirit offered himself without spot uh, to God, and purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The purpose of Calvary was to purge our consciences from dead works and bring us back into life it's eternal itself. So the question I'm going to ask here is this. How does God show me that I'm spiritually dead? Is there a way that God can show this to us? And yes, there is. The only way that God shows us, the main way that God shows us that we are spiritually dead is through his law. His law is a representation of his character. Great Controversy, page 478, and I don't have that, that text on the screen. It is only as the law of God is restored in its rightful position that there can be a revival of primitive faith and godliness among his professed people. So let's understand this. Let's take a trip into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. The law was put within the ark. Am I right? And above the law was the mercy seat, was put where God resides. Now, the law is there because it is the government of God is upon which everything else is built. And that is what is there. So without the, without the law being there, just imagine it would be total chaos. But God's law is there. Psalms 19 verse 7 tells us, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the law is a transcript of God's character. It represents God's character. It is who God is. Jesus is the law that lived in human flesh. Desire of Ages, page 467 and 468. Jesus lived the law in the sight of heaven, in the sight of the fallen worlds, and in the sight of sinful men. He was the embodiment or incarnation of the Lord, which is a transcript of his life and his character. Going forward, and I would like you to put that um, final slide on the screen. The final slide on the screen. Go back. Go back. Thank you. Many years ago, I came across 
this state. And Cheryl, I don't think um, where we found it is not there. It's found somewhere in the manuscripts of Ellen White, and I could never exactly pinpoint where it is. But for the matter of encouragement to this entire congregation and to anybody else, you need to listen to this, what the servant of the Lord says. It was under the entitlement of nothing is impossible with God. And here's what she says. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is so entangled that it cannot be made right by the loving spirit of God. No mistake is so serious it cannot be remedied. No human relationship is too strained that God cannot bring about reconciliation understanding. Next slide. In the back, next slide. No habit is so deep-rooted that it cannot be overcome. No one is so weak that he cannot be made strong. No one is so ill that he cannot be healed. No mind is so dull that it cannot be made brilliant. Last slide. If, I'll read it from here. If anything is causing any worry or anxiety, let us stop rehearsing the difficulty and trust God for healing, love, and peace. I love it. Is it possible? Is it possible for us to get the victory over sin? Yes, it is. Revival, an awakening, reformation, a reorganization, bringing you back to where God wants you to be can only be done through trusting in Jesus. The Sons and Daughters of God, page 337. Here is what Servant of Lord says. The slide is not there. She says the following. We are to have an eye single to the glory of God and thus grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The more earnestly and diligently we seek for divine wisdom, the more firmly established we shall be in Bible truth. By beholding Christ, by talking of him, by beholding of the loveliness of his character, we become changed. Transformation can happen only by daily experience. Sermons from the pulpit cannot save you. The Sabbath cannot save you. Eating proper foods cannot save you. Your money will not save you because that's going to be taken away. Yes. Because what, according to Revelation 13, the bottom line is between most of us and God, God is going to ask you, give me your paycheck. Yes. And that is the essence of turning everything over to him. None of that will save you. But Jesus, Jesus and Jesus alone will save you. We are told something very interesting here in the book of um, in the book of John, chapter three and verse fourteen. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And I, if I be lifted up from earth, I will draw all men unto me. May God bless you, and may he keep you, and may he shine upon you, and may the words of this study encourage you that you might look to be revived and reformed. And let us understand something. Revival does not happen on a corporate structure level. It is on an individual level. It is you and Jesus and you and Jesus alone. God bless. It was Ridley Hepper God.
who pen the words. Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings. There is no other beautiful way to end this discourse than to sing lastly from the heart the sentiments they express, except it happens from within. Everything else is going to be just a pulse rate. So as we rise to sing this as a closing number, hymn number 316, may this also be the prayer and the sentiment of our heart. Elder Jordan, thank you for bringing the word of God to us in such a way. Hymn number 316. Shall we all stand? I just personally want to say welcome to Liz. We've missed you. Thanks for being here with us today. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you have used your servant, Elder Jordan, to present your word. 
reminding us that revival and reformation must take place simultaneously in our lives. We recognize that the things on earth are pointing towards your second coming. We don't know all the ramifications of what has taken place in Europe between Ukraine and Russia and all the other powers that are getting into there. But Father, we know that your word said that we shall hear of wars and rumors of wars and men's hearts will be failing them for fear. But while those things are happening on the outside, dear God, we pray that you will cause these to make us have a reformation within ourselves. For the evangelistic series that we have upcoming, we ask that your divine presence would be with those who are presenting. And I pray that with sermon view that they'll be able to make the contact so that others will be able to have an opportunity to hear thy gospel and to respond affirmatively. May you now, dear God, bless us and keep us. May you make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May you lift up the light of your countenance upon us and give us your peace. In the name of Jesus, your Son, amen. Please be seated. moment of silent prayer. <laughs> 